What? 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 <laughs> so, okay, let's give a huge round of applause for Ricardo. He is a software engineer working at CERN. He joined CERN in 2003, worked on infrastructure for uh, the grid computing and uh, the grid computing infrastructure. Is currently working on the OpenStack team and runs a very large private cloud. Keep the claps going. Come on. Bas, it's energy tea. Come on, come on. Bas, bajate raho. Okay. Bas, it's energy, bajate raho. Hopefully we have. Okay. 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 I have to reboot my laptop quickly, but uh, I'll entertain a bit. <laughs> okay. So yeah, as as uh, was said, thanks a lot for first for inviting me to come here. Um, I've been to India a couple of times as a tourist, and uh, I've met uh, a lot of people from India during my work. So it's very, I'm very happy to be here and see no people from the community around here. And I look forward to talking to you all after. Closer? Okay, cool. <laughs> Okay, so if it's okay, I'll start. Um, I have a bunch of stickers here, so if all of you are interested in getting a CERN sticker after, I'll leave them around. Uh, I'm happy to share. Uh, there's also a couple, of, I don't have lo many, many left, but a couple of logos from our OpenStack okay. deployment. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it after. So again, I'll be talking about um, computing at CERN, so it won't be totally Python uh, specific. I will uh, try to explain why we do all this computing at CERN, uh, why we use Python, what kind of systems we run, and uh, the scale we have to run them at. So um, I hope it's interesting, and then I'll, I'll try to focus on the specific Python bits uh, that we use in different places. Um, so before, okay, so about myself, as, as was said, I, I joined CERN as a student in 2003, uh, as a technical student. It's a program that we have uh, where young engineers, or if you're still doing a deg degree, you can initially join CERN and start working in a big environment. Um, and then I stayed working in different areas. Uh, I'll cover a bit the areas I worked. Um, a lot of distributed computing and uh, development and later managing large-scale infrastructures. So I don't know how many of you know what CERN is. Um, I, I guess a lot of you heard of it. So CERN is a big uh, particle physics laboratory. Uh, so it's called the European, it stands for European uh, Organization for Nuclear Research. It was founded in 54, has 22 member states, and six additional uh, associate member states. Actually, India is now an associate member last year, uh, November. Um, 
and it's located between Geneva in Switzerland and the Jura Mountains in close by uh, French and Swiss border. Um, so the main thing that we run at CERN since a few years is the LHC. It stands for Large Hadron Collider. It's a massive uh, ring of um, magnets uh, that are underground, 100 meters underground. In total, it's uh, 27 kilometers uh, diameter. Uh, what it does, it's accelerating proton beams. So we try to do particle physics research by colliding very uh, uh, protons at very high energy. So we do this by accelerating them to close to the speed of light, so something like 99.99999% of the speed of light. And they, we circulate them at op in opposite directions. And from time to time, we make them collide at specific points where we run the experiments to analyze the data generated. Which means the, the wall infrastructure is cooled to minus It's colder than outer space. Uh, it's a part, the LEC is only one, it's the main one, but it's only one of a series of particle accelerators that we have and that we use for, uh, for uh, initially accelerating the particles before we introduce them to the LHC. Uh, there's four main experiments, ATLAS, CMS, ALICE, and ALHCB. I'll try to give a bit more detail here. So if you look at the diagram, you can see it's a large complex with multiple accelerators. But if you look on the bottom, from the bottom to the top, so there's the LINAC, which is the one that injects the particles, and then it starts in the PS, which is the initial uh, accelerator, and then it goes to the SPS that has been there for many dec decades now, and finally it goes to the main one with the LHC. And you can see the name of the experiments there, MS, Alice, and a bunch of other smaller ones, and uh, we'll see more details. This is the map of the place. So you can see on the bottom is the Geneva Airport, just for, it's good to imagine the scale of the place. So that's the main runway. And then you can see in small dots the border between Switzerland and France, and, you, and then the accelerator ring. So again, imagine that this is 100 uh, meters uh, underground, in total 27 kilometers, and then the main points are the four main experiments. In there, there's like, Back big caverns where we have these uh, detectors. So again, another view of it. You can see the Alps on the back, Geneva Lake, and then the accelerator complex uh, underground. Now, how do these look? This is a picture from uh, the tunnel. Uh, we have, you can see the magnets on the right, and there's not a lot of space left, so it's 27K. Sometimes we have to move around uh, the people doing operations down there. So most of the times we just go by bicycle. It's the easiest way. So this is a picture of, uh, the, there are two big gi giant detectors, CMS and ALICE. This is a picture of ALICE. And to have an idea of the scale, you can see the person like down there. And then it's a massive cavern, I believe 60 meters high, which uh, is completely filled by the, the, de the detector. You can see in the middle, it's where the, the beam passes, or the two beams pass. And then when they uh, pass in the detector, then they make them cross and collide so that the particles happen at the center of the detector. And then you see a bunch of electronics. These are our cameras, pretty much. So when, when a collision happens, then the trace of the, the particles being generated and all the energies is detected by uh, these uh, layers of, uh, of uh, electronics. And then there's a view of the Atlas detector. So this is the one I've been most involved with a few years ago. And you can see the big magnets that, uh, that participate in the, in the whole process. And then this is an, uh, an older picture. You have to imagine this being completely filled up uh, with, uh, with electronics everywhere. But it's, it's a pretty cool place. And yeah, some we organize visits and we get people coming every day to, to see it. So what results from this is that uh, from these cameras, as I said, these uh, detectors, uh, which is, you can see, imagine them as something that helps us see what's going on there, uh, we generate a lot of data. And CERN has been traditionally a place where uh, the computing needs are massive. 
not only because we look at, uh, we need to store and process a lot of data, but also because we have a lot of users, and these users are traditional distributed. So they are at CERN, but they can also be in different institutes everywhere around the world, including India. Uh, so that's why initially the World Wide Web was, uh, was created at CERN by Tim Berners-Lee. Um, the need for this was that there was a lot of information that needed to be shared among uh, physicists. So he decided to cre create a protocol and a standard so that people could define information and exchange information between them uh, using uh, standard protocols. And this was very popular inside CERN initially and then some institutions in the US and eventually just exploded into the what it is today. Um, now with the LHC we had uh, bigger challenges in terms of data. Uh, the, the production of data is, is quite spectacular. Uh, initially it was designed to produce something like 12 petabytes of data, so that's 12 million gigabytes of, of data a year. Uh, in actually this was predicted in the 90s while the computing mo models were being developed, beginning of the 2000 something. And then suddenly we saw that there was capacity to do more and the physicists saw that their detectors could perform better and then they wanted to store more data, which ended up in last year we stored 50 petabytes of data. So th this is for many reasons. The main one is that the, the machine is working extremely well, so better than predicted. So instead of running, the, running it for a small percentage of the year, we ended up running it uh, on a large uh, time. We had actual collisions happening on a much larger period than expected, so we get more data. Um, so we don't have capacity to process and store all of this at CERN. Well, to store we have, but not to process it. Uh, so from the beginning of 2000s and yeah, something like that, uh, we started working on a distributed computing infrastructure, which we call the LHC computing grid. This is a large computing grid of, that involves 170 different centers all around the world, spread among uh, 42 countries. And in total, I'll give more details later, but in total we run something like 2 million jobs a day. So these are all big numbers. In total, there's around 10,000 physicists involved in this project. So I'll try to run a quick video here. I'll hope this works. So. So I'll try to explain how, how it goes. So this is a video explaining how we do things and what is involved. So there's, there's the location of CERN in, in close to Geneva. So uh, where it all starts in Geneva called Mérin. Um, so this is, we get the protons from hydrogen bottles. These proto protons are injected using a linear collider. And you can see there's a booster that starts accelerating the protons. Finally, they move from the booster, they will move to the PS, which is the first of our accelerators, the small one. There you go. So this is, in, again, still close to our site, where we are located. Then once they reach a certain stability and speed, they are injected to a second detector, which is called the SPS. So this is the a much larger one. This already connects the two sites of CERN, which are separated by something like seven kilometers. Uh, so again, they are accelerated further, and then they are injected two beams of protons in opposite directions in the main one, in the LHC, we just saw pictures before. And then from time to time, we will make them collide at the center of the detectors. So you can see here, this, this, the, the number of collisions is like millions and millions per second. The, the proton bunches are made to collide from time to time. So all this, all this is, is tracked by these detectors. The result of this is that we generate a lot of data. So this data is stored in initially in the, what we call the trigger level farms, which do a reduction of something like a petabyte per second already to a gigabyte a second. And that's what we end up uh, storing in the, in the um, computer center. So this is our computer center, uh, the picture. We store something like four gigabytes a second uh, in the computer center when there's a uh, beam operating. Uh, we do st full storage and initial reconstruction. We actually don't have enough capacity at CERN, so we have another 
center in, in Budapest, and then we start spreading the data over the grid. So this is kind of the overview of everything that's going on. Uh, what we try to do by storing this data is to reproduce the, the collisions. So once we track the data, we need to see what happened. And the, the end result will always be some kind of plot or a histogram where with a large amount of data, the physicist will be able to detect what kind of particle was generated, if there was something new, if, was, if there was something unexpected. And that's pretty much it. So I hope it's explanatory. It has a fancy mu music on the back, but uh, here we can't, we can't really hear it. So I go back to the presentation. Okay, so enough for the introductions. I hope it's clear more or less why we do this, why we need all this computing. So I'll, I'll deep dive into the actual computing now. I'll try to cover three parts. The first one is the infrastructure that we run at CERN. So this is mostly how to run, how we run a large data center and a very large data center. And then I'll cover the distributed computing part. So this is all uh, what I mentioned, that actually we don't have enough capacity to do all, all the processing at CERN. So we, we integrated all these different sites around the world. And finally, I'll cover how people are doing end user analysis. What you'll notice is that Python is used heavily in all these uh, three layers. And I'll try to highlight wh wh where. So first, infrastructure is the CERN uh, cloud. So at CERN, we run uh, an OpenStack private cloud. Um, I'll give some numbers on how, it, how big it is. So this is a picture of the, the data center in uh, where I work in Meha. So uh, as mentioned before, we have two. Uh, we had to extend capacity and we didn't have enough place to do it here. Uh, actually, this is two floors. This is the top floor and then there's a basement that looks more or less the same. Um, so we have th around three and a half megawatts available uh, in this data center, plus two and a half megawatts available in the Wigner data center, which is the one in Budapest in Hungary. In total, we have something like 220,000 cores uh, today available in the in our data centers at CERN. Uh, we extended, so we had 100,000 just over a year ago, we had 110,000, so we've been extending in very quickly. We expect uh, new deliveries to come, so we are increasing uh, the capacity quite a lot. In total, around 212,000 servers, and then uh, we have a lot of data being generated, as I mentioned, 50 petabytes a year, so that means in total, right now, we have around 150 petabytes on disk and, and then a bit more on tape. The reason we use tape very extensively, the, the reason for this is that uh, they are very reliable and uh, they, don't, they are very cheap. And so we can have large amounts of storage without having to have problems with cooling, uh, uh, power, so which are the main issues of any data center, providing enough power and enough cooling. So tapes are really good. Uh, we keep extending the capacity of the tapes too. So we run a s OpenStack cloud in this infrastructure, which ha has al almost 30,000 VMs. And these are processing VMs, but also user VMs. So uh, as I mentioned, at some point, we didn't have enough capacity at CERN. So we extended our data center to Hungary. So we, we just extended our own data center to a different country. The way we did this was uh, we rented some space and put some servers there. And then we have two very fast connections between the data centers. Uh, in this case, it's two uh, links of 100 gigabit. And uh, the only issue is the latency is not uh, the same. So you notice if you're in the other data center, uh, if, you, if your application is very sensitive to latency, otherwise you don't even know. It's like uh, if you would be running in the same place. So two days ago, I went to the data center and I took a picture of the conference uh, uh, logo and uh, with the help of a friend we made a picture on one of the racks so this is one of the racks we run in the data center so just to <laughs> just to I thought this would be funny this wasn't completely legal but uh, it was done anyway okay so I'll try to give a bit of details on OpenStack so uh, who has heard of OpenStack or dealt not oh, really good. So OpenStack is uh, one of the biggest open source projects. Um, 
it it focusing on providing a full software framework and uh, layers to, to for cloud computing pretty much uh, it's completely written in Python uh, and the goal is to provide the three main layers the three base layers of any infrastructure which is compute networking and storage but it provides a lot more layers on top so extra services in addition to managing all your compute resources all your storage and networking it also allows you to have higher level services on top of it um, so it has frequent releases there's a massive uh, and very active community collaborating in all these projects and we do six month uh, release cycles so CERN has a very large private uh, cloud running on OpenStack, so we are very involved with the project and uh, both upstream and in the operations uh, side. Now, some of the projects, so if you are involved in OpenStack, you probably saw that each project now has a fancy logo. This is very recent. Uh, so Nova is the compute uh, project, so this is the core of OpenStack. It's the one that manages all the resources. Then you have Cinder for persistent storage, so if you're, if you're VM, or your um, machine needs some kind of uh, in external persistent storage, you will use this project. Glance for the images for the VMs. Keystone is the identity. This is a critical one if you're running a large infrastructure to make sure that it int integrates well with whatever system you already have in place. Uh, Neutron for networking and Horizon for the dashboard. And there are many, many, many more. I didn't have place. One that I work particularly with is Magnum, which is a very recent project for containers, and uh, this is the one I've been a lot involved in the last year. So a summary of the project. So again, one of the largest project, open source projects and in Python, and you can see the contributions from big companies, like no known companies, which contribute a lot, but it's also really important to see that 31% uh, is from others, or and even the independent contributions are quite high. This is important to keep uh, the project uh, open to everyone, otherwise uh, it would be taken by the priorities of big companies. It's really nice that it's uh, so spread uh, among uh, the contributions are so spread. And then the contributions per project. Again, there's a couple of projects I didn't mention there, like uh, Ironic. Ironic uh, provides bare metal provisioning for, for your data center. Uh, Cola, which allows you to deploy your op the OpenStack itself in containers, and uh, Tempest, which is a test tool. There are many, many more. Uh, one of the main things of this project, uh, which makes it so popular, is the workflow that is done for development. So it's uh, completely open, uh, not only the source, but also the process. The process is completely open. Every contribution, every comment, every change, every review is completely public. This is uh, really important. In addition to this, even the leads of the projects are um, elected. So this will go on six month cy cycle. So every six months for every single project in OpenStack, there's an election process where anyone can apply and then there's a vote and uh, the one with mo most votes gets, uh, gets to be the project lead for the next cycle, six months. So that's, that's really important. And then the, the, the process itself of defining the features. So if you have a small feature to contribute or a small change, then you will submit a blueprint. This means something like adding a parameter to uh, an existing command line or changing something small in the code. Now, if you need a bigger fix feature, then you have to uh, define what's called a spec. And this is a much l uh, lengthier explanation of why you're doing this, how you're doing this, uh, the alternatives you considered, and uh, the final conclusion of how this would work with some samples. This is done prior to the implementation so that everyone can uh, contribute to the, to the design, and then someone will actually take, take, the, take the task of uh, leading the implementation. All the code is reviewed is in Garrett, again, public in review.openstack.org. Uh, here's the contribution uh, workflow. So it doesn't matter if you're doing a spec or a, a patch or anything, it's always the same workflow. So there's the upstream code, which will have, in this case, it's the master branch for Nova. And then in your local environment, you clone it, you'll branch to do some development. Once you're happy, you submit it using a tool called Git Review, which integrates with this Garrett, which is a change management system. 
uh, it, it has the same Git API, but with some different f features on the versioning of the, the patch being submitted. Uh, from Garrett, this is made public. Anyone can go and provide feedback. You can go, if you're interested in the change, you'll go there and say, this works for me, this doesn't work for me, maybe we should do it differently. And you express if you agree with it or not. So you do this by doing plus one, plus minus one, plus two, minus two. So any change with uh, two plus twos uh, can, can be uh, pushed to, to, the, to the release. Uh, of course, there's a, a very large infrastructure also to run to run the tests of it. Uh, once the feedback has been uh, done, then the author can either submit a new one, a uh, new review, or uh, if it's ready, uh, then this just gets merged. So this 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 workflow works very well for this project. Uh, here's an example. So the first one is a change in Magnum. You can see code review plus two from Hongbin and Spiros. So Spiros is one of the contributors also working with us at CERN. Um, and then this, this gets workflow plus, plus one, which means it gets committed to the repository. The second one got some negative feedback, so it means please review my change, uh, my please review my comments and adapt as appropriate. So if you go to this URL, you can see how this works. Uh, and if, if you're interested in contributing, it's open to anyone. Now, one thing that I'll mention here briefly is that we have a large stack, as I mentioned. So this means uh, we had to break um, the, the deployment to scale. The way we do this is that the traditional OpenStack cloud would be one bunch of compute resources. Now, we can't do this with so many uh, resources. So what we do is we break the, the, um, the infrastructure into pieces. The end user only sees the top one, so it doesn't see the complexity behind, but for the operations, we have to know the details. So this is how we, we, we decided to scale our deployment. I, won't go, I don't have a lot of time to go into the details, but this is a quite interesting part. So this is the first part c concerning the infrastructure and our OpenStack deployment. The second part I'll mention is the this distributed computing infrastructure um, that goes on top. So again, we have a lot of resources at CERN, not necessarily enough. So we have a another layer on top that uh, connects uh, several centers around the world to help us. These are traditionally universities and research labs that have interested in the data we are generating. Um, so we call this the worldwide LHC computing grid. You've all heard for sure of cloud computing. Anyone heard of grid computing? There we go, a couple of hands. So if you would go back maybe 15 years ago, this was the hype of the moment, it was grid computing. The idea at the time was that we would provide something similar to the web for resources. So instead of just sharing data, you would be able to share any resource you have. Can it be computing resources, storage resources, any device you would need to plug. And uh, sometimes that would be the comparison with the power grid. You just plug it in and you don't know where it comes from, uh, but you just get whatever computing or storage you need. And in the end, this is kind of what we get today with, uh, with the cloud. Um, now, in our specific case, we wanted to run a grid for uh, the LHC data. So to compute, uh, to store, distribute, and al analyze all the data we have. And we have a lot of data. So y y y this is a um, transfer summary from three days ago. Just consider that uh, we don't even have a beam. The accelerator is, uh, is uh, on a technical stop right now. It will be restarted in uh, two weeks. And still, we are generating something like 20, we are transferring around the grid something like 20 gigabytes a second. So it's a lot of data. Because even when there's no, no new data coming in, the physicists are still analyzing uh, the previous data, requesting new, new data to be available at their sites, etc. So again, some numbers. We have part of this grid, 170 centers spread among I think all continents, 42 countries, and you can see the spread of uh, which experiment uses how much data. Um, the two main experiments being ATLAS and CMS. So a bit to visualize, somehow sometimes it's a bit hard to visualize how this works. 
So again, the flow is the data is generated at the LHC at CERN. Then we start distributing the data among the sites of this grid, grid uh, infrastructure. The main site is CERN, and we call this the tier zero. This is where the data is created. Once it's created, we store a copy on, ta on tape, and then immediately we start distributing it to two of the main computer centers in this infrastructure. So we call this the tier ones. The goal is that if there's some problem one day at CERN, we have copies of every single uh, piece of data that was generated ever. So we do this, uh, we do two replicas in these sites. Once that's done, then we start reconstructing the data. So this means uh, what comes from the detector, we call it raw data. And then we have to do some reconstruction to see what actually happened in these events. So we just store it blindly and then we try to run some algori algorithms that say, okay, here we got the Higgs, here we got something else. Um, so for this we have uh, hundreds, uh, uh, hundred something sites that we call tier twos that uh, will provide mostly computing resources. So we'll download the data from the tier ones and then do some processing and provide the output back to the, to the tier ones. This is the automated workflow that we do for the first pass over the data. And once we, we have this, the physicists can start analyzing in detail. So here's a picture we did some couple of years ago. We did some visualization for mostly for public viewing um, where we see the links between all the sites. So in here I summarize, so you can see there's a lot of sites in Europe, obviously. And then these green lines uh, are the links between different sites. You can see some links going to the US, some links coming to Asia. Uh, there's also sites in India. Um, and then you see the red lights being links also, but for some reason are not working. And then there's a live animation. So this is almost live, uh, almost real time. And you can see the transfers going and jobs being submitted. So one important thing is the numbers on top. So the I think this screenshot is a couple of years old, but you see that at any moment in this grid system, in this uh, grid computing we have, grid computing system we have, there will be something like 270,000 jobs being run. So uh, uh, just jobs sent either by physicists or by automated systems. And in this case, we are doing around 12 gigabytes a second um, of transfers between the all the sites. So to manage all this infrastructure, and this was where I worked uh, as a student and then later at CERN uh, for a lot of time, we need to do a lot of m systems for data transfer, bookkeeping, and processing. I don't know if you have experience with storage systems, but storage is really hard, uh, especially if you have large amounts of data like this. And especially if people are relying on files as the base, because it's uh, it's a hard unit to keep track of and makes bookkeeping quite hard. Um, so we developed this over the years. It took uh, something like six years to get into a production infrastructure. And we got it working before the LHC started in 2008. There's two layers. So there's the base layer, which is the infrastructure of this wall distributed computing system and this is where I worked on and then there's the experiment management layers so this means uh, all the systems that the experiments add on top uh, each one of them will have different computing models how they handle the data how they want to process the data so in the end they develop their own frameworks most of these are written in Python uh, I'll give a couple of examples of implementations done in Python so this is the monitoring infrastructure we developed I worked on this for a couple of years uh, so we at the time, this was 2005, six. Uh, there weren't so many frameworks as today, so we actually wrote our own monitoring framework at the time. What it do what it does is quite simple. It has uh, some consumers of data from different sources, storage, computing services, and then uh, pr uh, producers of data, and then consumers that are interested in collecting this data. Usually, what we do is we collect all this data and we store it in some kind of database system. Uh, traditional relation databases, but also file systems like Hadoop, uh, HDFS, and things like this for further analysis. Uh, recently, we are doing a lot of an, uh, f analysis on the efficiency of the systems using Spark and uh, similar tools. Um, so here's um, a screenshot of how it looks. Of course, 
there's a lot of the internals written in Python, but also the visualization we, we wrote in Python at the time. So this, is, this allows the operators to come here and see how is it performing today. And then they can go in detail in different areas, uh, which sites are performing better, which sites have ha having issues, and things like this. Then the second one is the distributed computing for Atlas. So Atlas, again, uh, it's the experiment I showed, the second um, big experiment I showed the screenshot. Um, they have two main systems. Uh, Panda is for computing, so for handling the, the um, computing of for Atlas. But the, the one I'll mention here is Ruccio, which is the second generation of the data management system for, for Atlas. Uh, I've also contributed to this project. Um, again, it's pretty much all in Python. You can see, uh, I think it's like something like 80% Python and the rest is just JavaScript for visualizations. Um, it's it's an Atlas-specific project, so it has something like 26 uh, total contributors. Um, it's stated here that it took 22 years of effort, but uh, the reason for this is the, that they count the, the whole design of the system from the time that Atlas was first approved as a, as a project. Um, so it's been steadily increasing. If you want details on implementation, you can go to this link here. I'll just give some, some details on, the, um, on how it works. So again, I worked a lot in storage systems we have the file as the base unit. So anytime there's beam, we generate events, and these events are uh, accumulated in uh, files that we store. Uh, files are really hard to handle. Uh, if you have files, uh, individual files, and we generate millions of them, then the bookkeeping uh, of all of this uh, becomes really complicated. And then if you have to move them around and track individual files, this would be very hard. So in, in, in the Atlas uh, project, uh, there was the notion of a data set. So a data set is just a, an aggregation of a group of files that uh, have some kind of uh, association. Usually it will be, they came from the same run uh, of the detector. Um, and then data sets are still not large enough, so they can be aggregated into containers with some other logic. So you can see here in the hierarchy, you'll have the individual files, then we call them run one, and then we have containers that says run period A, so a larger set, and then all periods, which is the top level container. Um, this makes it much easier to transfer. So if you need to move one file to, um, from say, from CERN to uh, somewhere in China, then if you would have to track every single file and transfer individually and monitor that it goes from one place to the other, this would take a lot of uh, bookkeeping load and tracking. So what we do is if they request one file, we see it belongs to this data set, we transfer the whole data set because probably the user will be interested in the rest too. Um, it's, it means that more data moves around, but it also means that for us the, the, the system I is much simpler. So usually these are called replication rules and they will say also how this data should be replicated. So for example, we can say this file should have two replicas at any time in any tier one. So then the system is smart enough to see, okay, um, I lost one replica there, I will just create a new replica somewhere else. So traditional um, uh, storage system replication. And then users or operators can say, okay, and for my site, I'm running, I have a bunch of users from the Higgs group and they are interested in, um, or in this case, the physics E gamma group and they are interested in the, this specific set of, of uh, data sets. So please make sure that these data sets are available on the tier ones and uh, at any time. And then the system will, will follow these requests. Uh, there are some plots there also on the volume of data. So you can see this is so just the total transfer volume. You can see the evolution. So it's building up, but if you look at something like April last year, where, where the beam had restarted, uh, in one month, the total transfer, transfer volume just for Atlas, which is one of the experiments, was something like 30 petabytes. So pretty large. Again, this was a Python project initially written by um, a student like myself, actually a Portuguese student that came to CERN with me. 
um, and he, he initially wrote the system um, as a kind of demo for, for his managers and uh, it worked so he, they evolved the system quite a bit. This is the new generation uh, rewritten after a couple of years. Now this is the second part I mentioned the, uh, which is the um, and your um, the distributed computing now the I think the most exciting right now is the end user analysis. In in the end all these systems only exist for this uh, which is for people to look at their data, do some kind of analysis and come up with conclusions on what what was originally there. Uh, at CERN uh, the main tool for analysis is called Root. This is a C++ uh, framework written during the 90s. So if you know MATLAB or R, it's very similar, just uh, uh, kind of specific to high energy physics. Um, what it does is uh, processing of large amounts of data and provides the usual uh, mechanisms to do statistical analysis, visualization and uh, storage of the data. So all the data is stored as C++ objects and then uh, you can use this, uh, this knowledge to, to navigate through the events. Um, it has very powerful tools um, and then the cool thing is the advanced graphics. So it, it really generates uh, very, very attractive histograms and plots uh, which in the end it's what they are doing. So well when, when a discovery is announced at CERN the process is usually that they will ana analyze a small amount of data and see some kind of variation, uh, like a new particle, something like that. And they will build confidence. So depending on the amount of data that they use to, to come up with to this conclusion, they will have a confidence level, which uh, in the higher energy physics is usually called uh, sigma. When they reach uh, this level, which means when they have enough data that they analyze that they can an uh, kind of put off any kind of statistical fluctuation, uh, then they declare a, f a finding. It's originally C++, but actually the Python bindings are, are very, very popular. Uh, here's an example in Python. So this is very simple. This is a very simple way of uh, of um, coding, uh, it, and the goal is that it is. So a lot of these physicists are not. Uh, they don't have a computer science background. They know how to code quite well, but they want it to be easy because in the end, what they are interested in is in the data. Um, in this case, we are just building a file and then generating a bunch of histograms and plotting uh, what was there. What it looks like is this. So these are plots. Uh, it's it's less uh, sometimes it's less exciting uh, than, for example, if you work in uh, um, astronomy or something where the images are incredible and beautiful. In physics, a lot of the big discoveries end up being a plot, which is kind of less sexy, but but it's uh, it's cool if you're involved. So in this case, these are the prim preliminary results from both Atlas and CMS for uh, for the discovery of the Higgs boson. So this was a presentation that was d done initially. So all of this work that I explained from the, the collection of the data from the detector storage at the computer center usage of the distributed computing infrastructure to replicate the data and make it available to the physicists. Finally, they will use their own tools and come up with a plot. And in this case, they see this variation at a certain energy, in this case, just above 125, 26 or 27 giga electron volt. Then you can see CMS having the same kind of, um, of a variation, which is a very big hint that there was something there. In this case, they were still announced as preliminary, but just a couple of days later, they, they declared uh, um, the new particle had been seen. Now, um, if you are interested in this area, one thing that is kind of really gaining popularity at CERN, traditionally, they would do this uh, analysis in their own, um, in their own um, laptops. Yeah, <laughs> thank you in their own laptops. So this would mean um, having to install a lot of the software in, in your laptop. Um, these frameworks can be extremely large. Um, so having to do the wall setup for every single user is very complicated. So traditionally, the many years ago, this was what was happening. Then we started having uh, central systems where the users would just log in and have all the tools they need, but still not, not uh, 
completely easy to use because sometimes you would end up uh, having to do a lot of configuration for your accounts. Now, Python notebooks are, are exploding in usage. Um, and the reason is that you can do really cool things uh, in a very easy way. So I, I will show this uh, MyBinder project. So if I, uh, I don't know if you, any of you has heard of this. This is a, um, a tool called, called Binder, Binder. And the guy that wrote it actually deployed um, a service running with the Kubernetes cluster on the back. So any user can go there and just run some kind of analysis or job. Um, so it's a cool project. Um, we created a CERN account here, which will be here. There we go. So I'll try to demo um, how you would eventually do um, physics analysis in, um, in, in CERN today, or one of the options. So what it did here is, again, this is running a Kubernetes, so a container cluster on the back. Every time someone logs in, it will launch a new container on the on the cluster, which in this case I believe it's running on the Google Cloud. Um, and then this is what you get. You get a really nice interface where you can interact directly with the code and without having to install anything on your box. So everything is running on your, on your browser. Um, so this is the introduction um, uh, notebook. You can see here that it's running a Python kernel uh, in the in Jupyter, in IPython notebooks or notebooks, uh, the kernel is the backend you're using, you're relying on. So I'll, cl I'll click on the Python one, you, s you can see again, here Python, it says kernel ready. So this means it deployed a cluster and then this is a very s easy sample of how this works. Uh, so this is how you do analysis, right? This is just an example. Um, the first step would be to import the library, and you can see, I can restart it here, just to make sure that we do everything correctly. There you go, restart it, connect it. So we'll try to run the operation. So you can run step by step and see what happens. There we go. So first step is to import the library, obviously. Then we'll create uh, uh, an example histogram, and we'll fill with uh, some kind of Gaussian distribution, just, just as an example. Then we create, the third step will be to create a canvas so that we can visualize the, the histogram. And then we'll start drawing the plot. So in the end, we get very quickly a histogram uh, as the ones we saw without having to install anything on your, on your local laptop. So everything working from a browser. This is important for the daily work, but it's also important if you want to share. Again, we come back to the need of sharing data between scientists. It's, it's critical. So the fact that you have a URL and you can have your own Git and create your notebooks and just give your, a URL to your, f to your colleagues and say, look at what I've done. I came up with this histogram. What do you think? And then they can, they can themselves go there and experiment with your code live and give you feedback immediately. This is extremely important in any, any science community. So again, I think this is pretty much it. It will just do a different drawing with some JavaScript. And then it will write this to an output file. So in this case, we are running, um, we are running this from, uh, from um, this binder project. But um, if we go back to the presentation, We have a new project at CERN that is called SWAN. I encourage you to click there. I can't really easily uh, provide this uh, uh, here because I would need to log in with my CERN credentials and you can't do it. For the first link, you can actually click on it and experiment yourself and start playing with some, some data from CERN. Uh, a lot of the data is available. Um, the second one is a similar concept. Again, uh, Jupyter Notebooks as a front end with uh, the only the big difference is that we integrate that bit, the front end, with all our internal systems. So this means that you have much easier access to the data that is located at CERN. Um, this means also that you log in with your credentials. So any kind of specific uh, data that you with restricts the access, you can also um, uh, have access there. Now, the last bit I'll mention this, and the main reason I, I do this is because. Uh, 
I've been working on it for the last year and I think it's quite relevant for, for uh, young people trying to do something cool. Um, how many of you have heard of Linux containers or containers? Everyone, that's pretty cool. Okay, so this is a, a hot topic uh, these days and mainly because of all these uh, needs for data analysis and some kind of interactive um, system remotely. Also for, for running infrastructure services, it's, it's very popular. Uh, the main reasons these are relevant is because they provide the levels of isolation uh, that we require and the performance, uh, which uh, better performance than what we get traditionally with, uh, with the virtual machines because they run in the same kernel. So they exploit some kind of internal systems of the Linux kernel or any other kernel that has container support. Um, to uh, to provide these two bits. Uh, the second thing that is extremely important is that uh, you can define your own containers. This means you just describe how what should be inside using a, an image description. At, uh, if you use Docker, it will be a Docker file. And then you create it and you publish it and advertise it to your colleagues and they can just run whatever you came up with. Again, the need for sharing uh, data and the experiences between scientists m makes this extremely powerful. It's very easy and it's gaining popularity in our community. Um, and then you can scale this application for, for um, um, something that was quite hard before. Um, as an example, uh, I'll show here. So you imagine a physicist that uh, comes up with a small algorithm for analysis of his data. He made it parallelized, but he can't really easily deploy it uh, because he doesn't have the resources. So what we are working on is providing a tool where they can easily scale this to um, to the size that it that it needs without them knowing any detail of the infrastructure. So while Vipin was uh, working with us last uh, last summer, uh, we were also running some tests d in containers. And uh, we run some cool tests. Uh, if you know Kubernetes, it's one of the popular um, tools we, we are supporting there. Um, so in this case, we try to run a scale test to see how far can we go with this kind of uh, infrastructure. So we, we started, we developed this, uh, we rely on this Magnum service from OpenStack. And we tried to start by seeing how large can our cluster be. So these are individual clusters. And we started to see, and how, how, how fast can we get them? So you can see here on the left column, on, on the bottom left, you can see the cluster sizes in no nodes. So we tried with two nodes, 32, 128, 512, and 1,000 nodes. So these are 1,000 nodes. It means that you would get a cluster of something like 4,000 or 6,000 cores. So quite, quite large. You can do a lot with it. Um, and then how much it takes. So for a cluster of two nodes, it takes like two minutes to get access to it. Then it stays quite stable, but you can get a cluster of a thousand nodes in 20 minutes. So in a physicist can click a button, go for a coffee, come back and have 6,000 cores available uh, with the configuration he decided to have to run his analysis. So that's, that's a pretty cool feature. We all we will even try to reduce this this number to something less. We think we can probably have something like ten minutes, but still, it, if all it takes is a coffee to have a six thousand core cluster, it's not too bad. Uh, the second test we s we did was to see how does the cluster itself scale. So we used one of these a thousand node clusters to see how we could scale it up. Um, we wanted to reach. Uh, so what it runs is a basic uh, web app with a lot of clients making requests. In this case, we are using a load of 10,000 clients hammering the service and seeing how, how this would scale. Um, we managed to scale it up to something like 7 million requests a second, just to prove the purpose of uh, having these clusters. Um, so, and uh, we wanted to go to 10 million, uh, but we actually broke the network uh, that we were using at the time with the load. So we learned a bit from it, and uh, we are redoing the, the test again to, to see if this improved. So just just as this was just a sideline, and uh, I think that's what I have. Um, I hope it was kind of clear how we do computing, where it comes from, all the layers we use. 
and especially how Python is, is extremely relevant for our community. One thing I didn't mention here is, uh, which is also very big, is that for a lot of this, um, these things we saw here with the notebooks, um, mo a lot of these things are being used to do machine learning. Um, so traditionally the algorithms used for high energy physics are uh, built, uh, custom, custom built. Um, uh, now with the hype on machine learning, there's so many toolkits and platforms that uh, are available that people started using. One of the popular ones is scikit-learn, uh, which has a lot of uh, the scientific libraries we need and the algorithms. So this is another thing that uh, I think will be picking up and why we want to have this easily scalable systems. And that's it, so. And if you have any other question. So I'm happy to answer any question. I I didn't go very deep into details of implementation because there was a lot of things to cover. Uh, if you have any question now or later, uh, my email is also here. So. Yes. You mean at the development level or? Uh? Hello, hello. Right. Exactly. Right. So for for infrastructure, um, so I think there's two two groups of people. Um, for a lot of the infrastructure, we do um, we we rely on. Um, a lot of engineers that have a very strong computer science background. So in this case, they are experts in their area and the development is done, um, you, you mean the process or uh, why? Levels of usage of Python. Ah, levels of usage. So again, wh what, Hello. We saw here, Hello. what we saw here, uh, so if you look at what we use, the tools we use, OpenStack is the core of the infrastructure and that's all Python. It's completely Python. Um, and it's done by us at CERN in a very small part, but in collaboration with uh, hundreds of companies and uh, thousands of people all over the world. So this is, I think, one of the biggest Python projects and uh, it's, it's the core of what we have today. So this is, uh, it's extremely relevant. The second part is this distributed computing infrastructure. So this, in this case, a lot, if not all, is developed in-house, and a lot of not all is in, well, not all, but a lot is in Python. So th I would say that um, for everything that is uh, monitoring, sensors, tools, everything is written in Python. Um, and then if you look at the experiment frameworks, uh, which are the tools on top of the distributed computing infrastructure, I think everything is written in Python. This is done by uh, some engineers, PhD students, uh, other students uh, in the uh, working in the experiments, and it's done by both uh, computer science engineers and some physicists that collaborate with this. And then at, um, at the analysis level, so the end user analysis by physicists, I would say that um, traditionally the development was done by in C++, and this is uh, historical. Uh, in the 90s, uh, C++ gained a lot of popularity because of uh, m many reasons, usability and performance. Um, in the 2000s, when Python picked up, gained popularity, the Python bindings for the C++ libraries became extremely popular. Mostly because um, um, physicists don't necessarily want the, to know all the technical details of how software works and how to optimize. They just want to get stuff done. And um, if we provide them with an easier interface, then that's what they will use. And Python was clearly the easier interface there. So it gained a lot in popularity. And I think this is the same reason all these high level tools like uh, notebooks that I showed are also extremely valuable. And notebooks were created uh, uh, for Python I I originally. Now they support different kernels. But uh, yeah, I, I, I would say, I, I don't know a number, but it's, it's massive usage of Python everywhere. Yeah, uh, excuse me. 
Uh, here. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is ready. So thanks for the great talk, Ricardo. Uh, my question is that you are in the thick of things. How do you see the data production of CERN going asymptotically? Like, what is the future projection? Right now, you are talking about 140 terabytes. How, like, by 2020 or maybe 2025, what kind of data scale, if we can say that, maybe from uh, PETA, EXA, where, where is it headed? What is, in some sense, in one line, what is the future of uh, data intensive or data centric computing? And how do you see the sort of uh, universe of data shaping up? Right. Uh, okay. Um, so I'm, I'm mostly familiar with the CERN use case. So I, I will try to talk on that uh, in the base of uh, CERN. So as I mentioned, um, when I joined CERN, the goal was to store 12 petabytes of data per year. Uh, today, we are storing 50 petabytes per year uh, with the current machine. We are doing an upgrade of the machine in a couple of years, uh, where the main number that tells us how much data we'll, uh, we will need, uh, which is uh, will generate, which is luminosity of the accelerator, um, this will have the, the machine will be called high luminosity LHC. So this will have a bump, a massive bump. Uh, there are several presentations from uh, from CERN managers where they explain how the expected growth rate of data and and c uh, computing resources is not uh, what we will need in ten years or eight years. Uh, is not the Moore's law wouldn't be enough. So the the current growth of technology won't match our computing needs. We'll have there will be a factor of three more in our own computing needs than what technology is available. Uh, would provide us uh, at that time if the growth would keep. So we are all looking right now at um, new technologies uh, that would solve this problem. And that's why we are looking at um, every, every bit. We are looking at the possibility of improving uh, infrastructure by building, having more storage, but that won't be enough. So we are also looking at improving performance of our own tools, optimizing everything. Uh, the growth of data, like we have 170 petabytes today, we'll have, yeah, we'll be in exabytes in, uh, in 10 years for sure we'll be in exabytes. So, and there are many, many institutions already at the exabyte scale, right? If you look at, uh, we used to be very big at CERN, we are still very big in the amount of data we collect. But if you, d if you look at uh, what, uh, what clouds like Facebook and Google and all these services are doing, it's it's uh, unbelievable. So we are expecting to get some help from them too in terms of uh, new technologies. I, w I wouldn't expect it to stop the growth. Uh, and as long as there's capacity, the physicists will tell us we need it. And uh, if they have, uh, if they generate 12, is because they can't generate more. If they can, they will generate 50 petabytes a year. And if they can do 100, they will generate 100, and that's it. Uh, hi. My name is Solomon. So I come from a scientific ba uh, computing background. So my question is related to that. Uh, so I have this general understanding that physicists prefer, prefer Fortran for scientific computing, for numerical simulations or so. And uh, I sort of imagine that that's also what uh, your uh, users would be interested in as well, right? So how does Python compare and what's the future? Do you see, uh, because you have new computing infrastructure, do you see that numerical simulations are also being replaced by Python instead of Fortran? Because, for example, in my work, we do a lot of Fortran for the actual uh, horsepower, but Python for the just front front end. Right. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think that's that's probably similar experience we would have. So there's still some Fortran in uh, at CERN for sure, uh, but in the 90s, most of the analysis transitioned to C++. So that's that's I would say the basis of all the frameworks that we have today. Um, there's still some fortune there for sure. Um, now, the challenge has been to give an easier interface to users, as I mentioned, and I think Python is a much, much easier, has a, a less intrusive entry point, so the, the, the learning curve is much smaller. And I think it's a pretty good level of uh, complexity versus performance we can achieve today for most use cases. Now, for, for a lot of use cases, this is not enough. So if you need to analyze uh, 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 
large amount of data in a smaller period, you probably will have to spend some time optimizing your code in C++ uh, directly. Uh, but for for most of the analysis, we are we are relying on Python. And if you look forward to what people are talking about in conferences and what has been discussed, uh, inside CERN there's multiple groups forming to investigate uh, different mach machine learning techniques to do the same kind of processes to for a high energy physics analysis, which is not necessary. Okay, the algorithms are similar, but the tools are not the same. And if you look at these tools, uh, they pretty much all have uh, the Python interface being the most popular. Uh, Scikit-learn is the, the one I, I've interacted most. And I think the, the if you look at what people are doing for machine learning and relying on Python, uh, especially data scientists, then uh, yeah, I, th I think this will just keep the trend.